Good morning. This morning, the third of the national political leaders. You've already seen Prime Minister Clark and NDP leader Ed Broadbent. Today, Pierre Trudeau, leader of the Liberal Party, former Prime Minister of Canada. Mr. Trudeau, is it not a fact, sir, with all due deference, humility and respect, that uh, you are running for the Prime Ministership of this country in a most reluctant fashion and that really you're just, if you win, you will become a pro-tem caretaker until a successor is chosen. No, Jack, that's not true. Can you disabuse me of that as I look at what's happened recently? Your form of campaign, your reluctance when you stepped out, you talked about public and private reasons strong both for going and staying. I think perhaps the people in British Columbia and the territories in the Yukon would like you to give us what happened from the time you were defeated until where you are now in terms of your personal plans. Well, Jack, that's quite easy. In uh, the fall, I decided I would retire, 23rd of November to be precise. Uh, I asked for the party to call a leadership uh, convention so my successor could be chosen. And uh, my caucus said, well, we're sorry to see you go, but uh, we'll do that. But what happens if there's an election before we have time to have a leadership convention? Would you come back? And I said, I wouldn't come back easily. I'd come back if I were asked three times on bended knee is the amusing form I put it in and uh, indicating that I'd be very reluctant to come back. I didn't think there would be an election uh, before the spring. I was getting out early before Christmas because I wanted precisely a new leader to be chosen before there could be an election. I didn't think Mr. Clark would put himself to be defeated in, a, in a position to be defeated in the House before the spring or perhaps the fall. Um, nobody knew then that uh, he would come in in a budget which uh, all the opposition parties were united to defeat. So uh, the unlikely thing happened that Mr. Clark uh, was unable to manage the House even more than two months and uh, the government was dissolved and we had an election. So the party said, you must come back and I accepted to come back. And you accepted reluctantly, as you've explained. How long will you stay if elected? I didn't if accept you reluctantly. Once I accepted, I decided I'd come in and fight and that was quite clear. I told the caucus, look, uh, you're asking me back and apparently you reached after a day's discussion a unanimous decision to get me back. Okay, I'll come back if you fight and for in this one together. And I said, uh, you know, I'll run this election on your coattails because you are the party, you are the people who are going to have to put the program together. I will lead you, but I, want, I don't want a reluctant army. I'll come back, uh, I'll hopefully set things right again, I'll undo some of the wrong things that the Tories have been doing, and then you can have another leadership convention because this is my last election. I'll say it, does that mean, sir, that you will sit if you wait? Let's put it this way. If the polls are correct, even though you only have one seat west of Manitoba, you will win the election. Is that not right? I don't trust the polls, Jack. I just don't rely on them. I think we have to fight till the last day, and then we'll see what the voters want to do with, uh, with the various parties. I but, sir, hope we will win. We're fighting to win. We're fighting to win strong. But I, I, I don't feel a fish has landed till it's in the boat. I think a fair question from the people of Canada, certainly the people of British Columbia, where your party on the face of it has no strength to win seats, maybe two at the very maximum, is if you are elected, will you remain prime minister for the full length of the next parliament? Jack, I don't concede that we have no strength in British Columbia. I think the voters will give you and me the answer next Monday. But uh, judging by the quality of the candidate, judging by the size of our support, judging by the activity of our, of our uh, party people, the grassroots, I think we will have good success in British Columbia. Next will month. I stay, will I stay uh, the full length? The answer is no. I'll want to have a convention before the next general election. Now, when will that be? Presumably, if we form a majority, which is something I, I obviously don't know, nor do you, that means that we'd have to have a convention sometime before four years to give the new leader time to get in there. I think that's a fair answer. Back to Clark, though, um, or back to your role in the defeat of Clark. From this distance on the West Coast, relying on the Eastern media mafia, in whom I don't put great faith, 
it would seem that the defeat of the Clark government was more or less accidental. In fact, and the accusation has been made by some national people that you were protected from the wishes of some of your senior cabinet colleagues and that there was a little bit of a conspiracy to keep you in the dark and create this quick defeat. Can you answer those charges? Oh, yes. Quite, quite, uh, quite simply. Uh, many people uh, in the party and some people in the caucus didn't want uh, to defeat the government. I personally wasn't anxious to defeat the government. When we were this, that afternoon deciding that as a party we would vote against the budget, I honestly didn't think the government would go down to defeat. So it's no great charge to say that uh, a lot of people didn't want to defeat the government. We wanted that budget to be stopped. We wanted to go on record as it being an unfair, unjust budget which was hitting the middle and low income people with an 18 cents excise tax which was not going to provide any energy security but merely permit the Conservatives to come forth with their mortgage program. So uh, we wanted to go on record in being against that budget, but I was convinced that the Tories in some way would get, the, as they had in the previous vote of non-confidence, would get the creditists to support them. I mean, that's what you do when you, you're a minority government. You would have made a deal with the creditists, wouldn't you? If you had been in that position. If I was a, a government leading a minority government, as was the case in 72, 74, I would realize that I don't speak for a majority of Canadians. And I would try and govern with the support of a majority of Canadians, which means getting the support of a majority of the people in the House. And that's what we did between 72 and 74. Sometimes Mr. Stanfield's party would support me, sometimes Mr. Lewis's party would. Mr. Pearson did the same thing when he had a minority government. You can't pretend that you represent a majority of the people when you don't, and that's what Mr. Clark, I think in his arrogance, tried to do. Arrogance or stupidity? Lack of experience? Bumbling incompetent have been the phrases used by your liberal candidates and by some of the media people? I don't know. Any, any hypotheses will not be answered except by Mr. Clark. What I think happened is that they believed that the liberals wouldn't dare go into uh, a, a, a strong vote against the budget because we were leaderless after all. We were in a convention. We were going to have a leadership convention, which meant that for the next couple of months, uh, various liberals would have been fighting against each other, pr producing different programs, contradicting each other as to what was right for the party. And Mr. Clark or his troops probably made a gamble. The leaders in this weakened state will never dare bring down the government. And if they do, we'll lick the pants off them because they're going to be fighting for the next month but or two. Isn't it an, hasn't this not been an appallingly low-level campaign, Mr. Trudeau, as we have seen it? Shall I give you a couple of points? Yes, please give me a couple of points. It yeah. seems to be entirely on image and style. Uh, Clark is a wimp. You call all kinds of horrible things. You're the shadow. You're hiding. You won't speak to regional press. You won't do this and that. You've been programmed by Keith Davey. I'm quoting accurately. The wimp and the shadow programmed by Davey. And the election will be won, will it not, sir? Not on a question of programs, but on image and style. Well, if it is fought on that basis, it's because you and the media are putting it on that basis. I have discussed the issues, I've discussed the budget, I've discussed Petro-Canada, I've discussed the foothills, I've discussed uh, the port of Vancouver, I've discussed uh, the increase in the guaranteed income supplement. The media, you, are saying, well, we're, we're going to make a personality fight. And from the outset, I said, this isn't a personality this fight. This is a team. That not only this is a team, but this is a campaign I want to see fought on issues. Remember the last But you campaign. lost your team. How do you mean I lost my team? Oh, do we have Art Phillips? I'm talking Peter about Pierce? your senior Gordy team. Gordy Gibson? Your senior team. Oh, you mean, you mean those that you were calling dinosaurs when they were in the team? Not necessarily you know, me, that's, sir. That's, you, and the, that's the, you and the media. When we have, the uh, when we have a, great, a great cabinet, you say, oh, these are all old men and women. They should be replaced by some of the younger people. When the old men and women, so-called, you know, younger than you and, and me Andres probably, Faulkner. decide that they're not going to run again, uh, you say, oh, you've lost the best men. Why don't you say to the best men when they're in the team rather than wait till they've retired? You know, wh I bet you said some nice things about me, Jack, when I retired. Oh, I was gracious well, beyond well, belief. Well, say them now this morning. Just say, let me ask you one now. sharp question, sir, and you give me a short, sharp answer. Uh, and this demonstrates your lack of team, perhaps, sir, to viewers. Why is Donald McDonald not running in this campaign, your obvious heir apparent? 
Well, he came out of politics about two years ago, saying that he was going back to his family, and he wanted to practice law and bring up his kids. Why should he change his mind now on this campaign? Because he made very sound, very loud noises about going for the leadership if you had, in fact, uh, so, not come back. Well, so did, so did other people. The Turner, po he's not your heir apparent, is he? Well, I don't know what you think, Jack, but uh, Mr. Turner has said that he wasn't going to run again. He wasn't interested in leading the party. But should so. your heir apparent not be running in this election, Donald McDonald, sir? But you say he's my heir apparent. All I say is that the next leader to succeed me, if we form the government before four years from now, the next leader will be chosen amongst past parliamentarians or present parliamentarians. And there's a lot of good people going to be elected in this parliament. A, philosophic, a philosophical question, sir. You're the philosopher, and I'm the redneck. But nevertheless, would it not be a much better way of choosing a prime minister if we went back to the old traditional system? of the largest group in the House of Commons picking the elected MP in whom they had the most confidence. What do you call that the oldest system? I think that's the system that uh, may be practiced in, uh, in, well, in Britain. I it think is. this could have been the system practiced by the, the caucus uh, if they'd wanted to. But um, what our, I'm our constitution says that we will have delegates choose our leader, and I think that is good because it means that not only the parliamentarians will choose, but it means that all those who support the Liberal Party across the land can help choose the next Doesn't leader. Doesn't it fall and into I think that is much better in a country like Canada, which is so broad. I was going to say, doesn't that fall into the American pattern that you have to pick a man regardless of worth because of his, because you must have someone you can merchandise. Well, in this particular case, it seems that uh, redneck or not, you have the best of all worlds because the caucus itself picked me. And then it was only a couple of days later that the federation representing the grassroots roots got together and decided that they too would want me to lead the party again. So here we are. We, and I you're was elected here, by anyway. a convention in 68, and this time I'm chosen by the caucus and the federation just as you wish it should be. How about some issues? If, you, that have, be if nice. you really have a liberal platform. That'd that be nice. We'd get away from personalities and start talking about the subjects. Mr. Trudeau, after the break. Mr. Trudeau, it's yes. an unhappy fact, perhaps, that Clark, the Prime Minister, won the last election a minority because of the anti-Trudeau vote. And really, this campaign is almost in reverse. Your people think you'll win because of the anti clark vote. True? Uh, we're discussing issues now, Jack? In a moment, but oh, oh, sorry. that's a good philosophical uh, point. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I think people judge uh, quickly nowadays. They, uh, they make up their minds that a guy can do it or he can't. And uh, it took them 11 years to decide I couldn't do it, in part. You're still a little bitter about being defeated. Bit what? A little bitter about being defeated. Never have been. Never have been. No. Um, let's go straight to the Olympics. What should the policy of Canada now be that all 73 members of the IOC, despite their nation's political wishes, have said, go to Moscow? What would you do? Uh, what is your attitude this morning on whether or not we should um, support the Americans, American political position and pull out of Moscow? Well, it would remain what it, what it has been, Jack. I don't think uh, the, support, the supporting of a boycott, if it's going to show the Western nations and the third world divided, I don't think it's a good thing. I think that this kind of a symbolic gesture of boycotting the Olympics uh, is only effective if it shows that there is a massive participation by not only the Western nations, by a lot of the third world nations. So you think Otherwise, Moscow scores a propaganda victory, as it probably will this morning, by saying that uh, uh, all the Olympic committees of every nation want it to go along. And they'll say, you see, uh, a, few, a few countries, a few capitalist countries, uh, because they knew they were going to lose the game, uh, didn't want to come. But all those countries who believe in the rights of man, all those third world countries, Africa, Asian, Caribbean, and so on, they're all with us. And that's a bad result. After all, boycotting the Olympics is not for the pleasure of keeping some athletes uh, away from the games. It's to prove that 
morally, the whole world has condemned uh, the Soviet uh, Union. You say no boycott unless it's solid, and such a solidarity has now been killed by Kalanin's committee. Well, uh, it will depend on how the various uh, governments re react, but uh, obviously this, uh, this committee, this decision of the uh, International Olympic Committee has shown that uh, the boycott is not going to be unanimous. And if it's, uh, uh, it wouldn't have to be unanimous, but if it's not, I repeat, massive, it won't be effective because the games will go on anyhow. The Soviet people will see a uh, lot of African nations, a lot of Caribbean nations there, and they'll say, well, of course the United States didn't come, but they're a bunch of capitalists and they couldn't win the games anyhow. Mr. Trudeau, tankers on the West Coast. And I'll try and refresh your memory, first of all. The one liberal MP who fought against tankers on the West Coast, like Canada's Ralph Nader, Nader was David Anderson. He was banished to the West Coast because your people didn't like what he was doing in Washington. That's not so, Jack. Is that not a correct historical fact? No, it's not a historical fact. He was an active member of our caucus. Uh, he had great input into the caucus. He didn't convince anybody, everybody he was right, but he didn't convince the electors of British Columbia that he was right. He wasn't elected in the next election. In the provincial so is government? That, is, no, no, I'm talking federally. He was defeated. Does that mean that the people of the West Coast uh, didn't want the uh, tankers to stay away because they defeated him? Sir, we of course have, not. It we, means that there's a lot of issues which are, which are put together. But who has really done anything to attempt to stop tankers in the West Coast? We have many big tankers now. Admittedly, they're, out, they're not coming in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. But they will. Now, did your government really do anything to bring a land route for oil? Yes, down for oil, you're quite correct. Did you, sir? Of course we did. When the United States in February of last year said, okay, our administration before the end of this year has to decide whether we're going to bring the oil down the West Coast into the northern tier, whether we're going to bring it down the West Coast across the, uh, the Rockies in Canada or whether we're going to bring it down the uh, Yukon and northern British Columbia and, and Alberta. This is going to be our decision before the end of the year. What do you Canadians say? What is your input? Our government very firmly said it must be the foothills route. It must be through the Yukon and Canada because we don't want tankers. We made that position clear last April. I made it clear here out in the west at the Petroleum Club in Calgary. And that has been our position. Now, an election was uh, right. held on the 22nd of May. Mr. Clark's government dithered all through the summer. Mr. Natashin, as Minister of Energy, was being pressed by us to reaffirm his commitment to that land route so there wouldn't be tankers. And Mr. Natashin was saying to the CBC as late as the end of August, well, I won't be bullied into this. I won't be stampeded. I want to look at the various alternatives. So that the whole summer went through without the United States government knowing that the new Canadian government was supporting our view. It's only on the Foothills 28th Foothills withdrew, of sir, and you also lost the battle, though, didn't you? Foothills withdrew. We didn't lose any battle. We weren't the government. You know, if we had been the government, I can tell you that the battle would have probably gone the other directions. And Foothills withdrew because obviously, as we know now, Mr. Clark was supporting the Trans Mountain Route. And that became evident sometime in November or December. Why did Foothills withdraw? Because, you know, because the they N saw they didn't have the support of the government. And, I and also because the NEB said you haven't presented proper environmental considerations and they had financing problems and they felt little encouragement. And, and also part of the consortium for the Foothills was Petro-Canada and I think a lot of people in the Clark government didn't like Petro-Canada and Foothills saw that it wasn't, wasn't having the support of that government, so it withdrew. Let's jump to, to Crosby's jump, budget. Jump anywhere you want. All right, let's jump to Crosby's budget. It wasn't that bad. It, was it, surely, wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Surely it said it was the first time we were told that we faced inflation of 10, 11 percent, between 40 and 50 percent inflation in four years, that he told us brutally and up front that we've got to pay 18 cents a gallon excise tax on gas, that we're going to have the $4, $4, $4, and $4 increases, and he laid it on the line for the first time, sir. Was that not honest and straightforward of them? Well, let's look what it was done for, Jack. What was the 18 cents going to do? It was going to bring in $2.4 billion, 18 cents a gallon on gasoline, taxing the farmer for his diesel, taxing the fisherman for his 
fuel, taxing the man we who know goes to work. So, all right. What was it going to do, that 18 cents a gallon? It was going to bring $2.8 billion in. in 2.4. 2.4. May I correct? Four, you're right, Jack. 2.4 billion. And the mortgage credit was going to cost 2.8. Sir, 2.4 a year and 2.8 over the four years. Wrong. Two, wrong. It was going to, it was going I to... I quote Stevens. Well, don't quote Stevens. I think, I think he says, different. did Crosby not tell me between 575 and $750 million for the first year of the mortgage tax credit? Sure, but when it is fully implemented by 1983, when it is fully phased in, it it's will. going to count two point, cost 2.4, 2.8 billion. Now, the 18 cents and more will be needed to pay for that. Oh, not, not one cent not in of the it, initial year. Not one cent of it is going to bring energy security to Canadians. So you have all Canadians across the land being taxed on every form of transportation in order to pay for a mortgage scheme that the Tories decided to bring in and which is going to help a minority of Canadians. Sir, and that's going to bring in nine billion dollars more or less over four years. The mortgage tax credit is only going to cost what over four years? Well, just... Two point eight. Multiply 2.8 by 4, and you'll get what it's going to cost. That's not what they say, sir. Eleven. They well, just you know, it, it's going to be phased in, Jack, I realize. But the United States brought in such a scheme in 1916, I think, and it's going on forever. They can't take it out now, because once you tell a homeowner that he's going to get credit on his mortgages, you never take it away. No, you can't. So you can't say that it's just going to be for one year, 2.8 billion. It's going to go on in our tax system. And this energy tax and credit for the lower income groups was a good idea, wasn't it? Sure. Amounted $90 and $90 a man and wife, 30 bucks for kids. A great idea. We pay for the extra gas prices. N wonderful. You're telling in British Columbia that because of the increased cost of gas and of the tax, they're going to have to pay about $600 a year more because of Mr. Clark's budget and his, and his energy policy. He's going to pay $600 a year more, and in return, he's going to get, what, $300 and, and something? Some dollars. That's a great budget, isn't it? But there was know? going to be $6 billion for energy-related purposes. He was going to get $6 billion out of the $0.14 cents a gallon on gas. No, Jack. One. No, look at the budget again. $90 billion is what uh, uh, Mr. Clark's budget was going to bring in over right. the next four years. Forty billion of that would go to the producing provinces, mainly Alberta. Thirty-three would go to the multinationals, mainly foreign-owned. Seventeen would go to the federal treasury for a total of ninety. But out of that seventeen, how much was going to go to the energy bank? For Six billion. No, out of that. 1.8 billion was going to go to the energy bank. Sir, so you know why when you, you when you when you raise when you raise 90 billion dollars, proposedly for energy security, you don't have any guarantee at all that 40 plus 33, 73 are going to be used by Alberta or the multinationals to find more energy in Canada. I'm telling you, you're pulling a fast one on the Canadian Has people. Has he made a deal with Lockheed? Well, he, he wasn't even able to make a deal with Lougheed because when he brought the budget down, Mr. Crosby was admitting that they hadn't fixed the form of the tax yet. So after putting this fresh face on federalism of saying there'd be no confrontation after seven months of the Clark government, you've got Lougheed and Davis at each other's throat, and you've got Mr. Clark saying, well, I've got a red face now rather than the fresh face, and I haven't been able to manage a deal after all this time. Sir, one question before the break. Can you tell me that if you were in power, you could do anything very different about the rise in oil prices? Well, I can tell you, Jack, that between 1973 and 1979, after the OPEC crisis, every year we sat down with the provinces and we struck a deal, which Peter Lougheed and Alan Blake well, agreed, sir, agreed but the to. The point I'm making mm -hmm. is, as a realist, which you surely are, mm -hmm. under you, gas prices for farmers and everybody would go straight up as under the Tories. They would not, Jack, because we have a formula for pricing which says to the producers, look, you can get oil out of the ground at $8 a barrel and still make a profit. It's oil that you found 15, 10 years ago before OPEC. You can still make a profit at $8. Why should you get $30 or $40? Because that happens to be 85% of world prices. And we say you're not going to get it. It's as simple as that.
Would so there's you? no reason to make the farmer who's a Canadian and the fisherman who's a Canadian and the commuter who's a Canadian pay world prices for a natural resource which is in Canada and which can be produced at a profit at 8 or $10. Have you any plans to tax the undoubted massive windfall profits in the years ahead of these multinationals? Well, I'm telling you with our, for, with our formula that perhaps won't be a uh, very great windfall profits because if they're getting $30 a, a barrel, say, under Mr. Clark's formula and they're only getting 8 a barrel under our formula, they're not going to be great windfall profits. And that's why Mr. Armstrong, the president of Imperial Oil, has been making a conference saying this is a terrible uh, scheme that the Liberals are proposing. Of course it's a terrible scheme. The money is going to remain in the pockets of the consumer rather than go to Exxon. Mr. Trudeau and Webster after the break. Flora MacDonald has been very outspoken that draft dodgers in any crisis in the United States would go to the bottom of the immigration list for Canada. Do you endorse those sentiments? I don't know what, it, what they mean, Jack, quite frankly. What does the bottom of the list mean? We have an immigration system. We give points for, for health, for uh, family relations. We have, give points for your ability to find a job. And you don't put them at the bottom of the list. Anybody who wants to immigrate to Canada, we have no quota system. We don't have it for the blacks. We don't have it for the Americans. We have a total amount of people we're going to let in in every year, and anybody who can qualify, American or not, comes I am in. not being sensational, sir, but you must surely remember the considerable resentment there was, certainly in British Columbia, not about legitimate refugees from the Vietnam War, but all the other people who, who slipped into the country and who, who were eventually given by the Liberals an amnesty. And Florida makes political points by saying, hey, hey, we'll go easy on some of these people. Well, we, were, we gave an amnesty to... Uh, not American draft dodgers in any great number. We gave an amnesty to a lot of people from other countries of the world, uh, Europe, Asia, and so on, who came in as tourists in the late 60s and early 70s, came in as tourists and stayed and went into hiding. Mm -hmm. And there were thousands of these people who were in hiding and who were living in fear and illegally, and they'd married and had kids and so on. And we said, look, We'll erase the past. We'll tighten up entry for the future. But you people don't have to stay in hiding in Canada. You've found a job. You've raised a family. You're welcome, Canadian. You have a more liberal outlook than Florida MacDonald. I don't know, but I know that as liberals, we believe uh, in a bit of humanitarianism. Carter, in fact, uh, not Carter. I was going to say that Carter and Clark may both have been saved by Iran. Well, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Clark will know the answer next Monday night, and Mr. Carter will only know, I guess, uh, sometime next November. But really, uh, it was handled quite well by the government, the whole Taylor business, wasn't it? The hostages. Jack, you know I wouldn't want to criticize that. It was handled quite well. Yes, it was. Yes, yes. Uh, you were attacked on this program by the self-same Florida MacDonald for your use of if true when you were questioned that particular day. And she said that you were well aware of all the facts and indicated that your if true reference really was putting a tongue in cheek unfairly when in fact you knew everything was true. I knew, I knew of the hostages and I knew that they had been smuggled out. The reason I said if true is that it had not been announced by the government. I think it had been leaked a lot of places as is now obvious, but I didn't know that. And as long as there were hostages, as long as Canada had played a secret, subterritious, sub, whatever it is, surreptitious. Role, surreptitious role, I didn't want to spill the beans. Because supposing the Clark government and Miss McDonald had said, look, we're not going to mention this. If there's any leak, we'll say no comment. Maybe things happen. The refugees all over the world, they have to get out of frontiers. We're not going to announce that we smuggled some out because it'll just mean that countries will start tightening up their, their, uh, their exit procedures. So if that had been their attitude and I had not said if true, I had said, yes, they are out and I congratulate. You would have confirmed it. I would have, spilt, I would have spilt the beans and I wasn't intending to Understood. spill the beans. Once the government said it, then I withdraw the if true. It is true and I'm happy that it happened. Consistently, for some months now, one of the most damning attacks made on your liberal administration for these many years has been that you allowed the armed forces to run down participation in NATO, poor equipment, slow enlistment, drop in numbers, too many generals. Sir, 
and the armed forces seem to think that, judging by the statements of some of the serving officers. Well, do, you, do you accept that, that you allowed the armed forces to run down and did not allow them to play a full share in their national or the NATO roles? I'm not sure who you're no, alluding to when you talk about uh, serving officers. Paradis and Falls. Well, I beg your pardon, Mr. Falls, Admiral Falls, the chief of staff, was criticizing a Tory minister, Mr. McKinnon, his defense minister, for having attacked the structure, the command structure Correct. of our armed forces. And that never happened in my administration, particularly not at a time of international tension. We never had a public fight between the minister and the chief of the defense staff, as Mr. Clark's you government is having You properly correct now. me on that, but it is a fact, sir, surely, that you allowed the 10,000-man NATO brigade to go down to a much smaller and less uh, well-equipped component. Not less Nora, well, NATO not less well equipped. A smaller from something like 10,000 in Europe to about 6,000 in Europe, but better equipped. We've uh, we've got the long-range patrol aircraft, the Aurora now, which patrols the northern Atlantic for NATO. We've got better equipment on the ground. We've got Leopard tanks instead of the old obsolete tanks. We've got armored personnel carrier. We have. A few less men, but we have much better equipment. And I believe in a modern army, it's better to have good equipment than more men uh, slugging it Are you foot. saying you kept the armed forces in good shape, sir, and encouraged recruitment and encouraged our major participation in, in Europe? I kept things in perspective, Jack. I, I, I gave a commitment to NATO that we'd increase our armed forces by 3% a year in real terms, and I kept that. Now, at the same time, I was working for peace and detente. And I make no apologies for that. And if I could do anything in the past or in the future to prevent a Cold War from getting, co getting hotter, I would do it again. And after all, the United States in those years, and even until today, are trying to reach a de-escalation of armed forces. They're, they're negotiating a SALT treaty, the Strate Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty with the Soviet Union. They want to have less armament in the United States if the Soviet Union has less armament. And Canada, under my government, worked in that direction, and we would do it again. Don't we think there are more useful things to do in this life than to fight wars and to put a lot of dough into armaments. Our chief of defense staff and his whole defense command uh, made a, uh, a project of what the army should be, what the armed forces should be. They said, we want more money for equipment and less for men. We gave them more money for equipment and less for men. We budgeted two and a half billion for the for the uh, new uh, fighter aircraft. We Which still we, isn't bought. Well, is that our fault? Well, I mean, you were in long the, enough to make a decision, weren't you? Well, we had the, we had the uh, the data come in sometime around February of, of last so year, and not, the government was defeated. The armed forces are not in good shape right they now. They are in they? good shape. Where did you get that? Uh, from serving dust? soldiers, from. Uh, People like Porter, who wrote an excellent book, which seems to be fully supportable, called In Retreat. No, look, the military are like anyone else. They naturally like more equipment and more people. But so would the Department of Finance, uh, so would the Parks uh, Administration, so would, uh, so would uh, the Coast Guard, and so on. You have to keep a balance. We are increasing, we have been increasing the military budget 3% in real terms a year. That means inflation plus 3, does it? That means inflation plus 3. And the capital budget increased by 12% a year. That means inflation plus 12. Okay, Jim. You know, obviously they'd like more submarines and more costly airplanes and more of them and more people. But I'm not, I'm not saying that the whole, the whole uh, policy of the federal government should turn around the armed forces. I think they're one element of our society. Short snapper to give us a laugh, okay? Well, that'll be easy. Have you withdrawn your promise to double track the CNR to the coast? Not at all. I think it's, a, I think it's a very important because we know that by 1983, we know that uh, the CN and the CP will be operating at capacity and that the increased produce of the farmers, of the potash producers, of the forestry won't be able to carry to the coast. It's not the track, but sir. It's the port. That's the problem. It's not the port, Jack. I mean, the bottlenecks are in the Rockies. The bottlenecks will will have been completely build, blocked by uh, 1983. Are you planning a new route to the coast then? Because when it comes now, you've got railways on each side, and you can 
find it be damn difficult to double track. Well, you sound like those who in the 19th century were saying you can't go through those Rockies uh, with one track, let alone two. But they put two rails on the trains. Mr. Came Trudeau through. is serious about double tracking the CN over a number of years. Yes, and the CP2, which have already double tracked 30%, uh, because we have given them a tax incentive, a, a fast write off. So they've double tracked 30%. The CN has only double tracked 10%. But they both want to do more, and they will more under our government. Mr. Trudeau and Webster, after the break. Mr. Trudeau, uh, Mr. one Webster. simple, straightforward promise you've made is to old-age pensioners. Could you please repeat it? Yes, Jack. The guaranteed income supplement, that is the part of the pension paid to those who are needy, over 65 will be increased by $35 a month per household. That means that if you're two old age people living together, you'll get a more uh, another $35. If you're a widow living alone below the poverty line, you'll get $35. Right. Uh, Tories have promised nothing on that. The NDP. Uh, did you ever implement the promise, the statement made by Andrus in the House, that you were going to cap index pensions for civil servants? Yes, we brought down a formula that made sure that the civil servants' pensions were self-financing. Over a period of three years, we made sure that through their premium, uh, they, would be, they would be paying for any increase in pension. And if, if the pensions were going up faster than the, uh, the money coming in, we would lower them. We would cap them, to use that expression. Pretend we're having the debate that you didn't want. And pretend that I'm broadband, sir, just for a moment. I, as Broadbent, say, as he said in this program, if elected, or he means if in control of a government, if elected, I, Broadbent, and the NDP will arbitrarily, by legislative authority, reduce interest rates. What would you tell Broadbent? Well, first, I would cut them. Well, I'd say that the debate I didn't want was not with Broadbent being you. You know, I'll do this any time with you, Jack. I think when we reach. Uh, 200 or a quarter of a million people. I think that's that's the kind of interview I like. I've had 12 in this interviews in this campaign, as against 10 in the last. So, what would I say to Mr. Broadbent? I say you can't legislate interest rates down unless you're prepared to put exchange controls on, or unless you're prepared to see the Canadian dollar fall uh, into a bottomless pit. And I'd say that is not our choice. And. Uh, First of all, you'll never be the government, so you don't have to uh, live up to that promise. But you can't legislate interest rates unless you control the whole economy. Interest rates are set by the market according to all, uh, supply and demand. Of, right. Of, and of if savings. Mr. Broadbent is pulling on your coattails and you are a minority liberal government, that's one of the entreaties to which you will not listen. Well, I don't even examine the hypotheses of being a minority government. I don't even know if I'll be the government. So I will... I will... <laughs> Uh, look at the results next Monday. And I saw you on a French television interview the other night, the day before yesterday, saying, to my astonishment, the national unity was not discussed in this campaign because you had been told that in English Canada it wasn't an issue. Is that correct? Not that I had been told. Uh, that it was obviously not an issue. People wanted to discuss the economy. They wanted to discuss energy. Uh, the last campaign you recall during it and the whole period leading up to it, everybody was saying the Liberals are going to try and use national unity because it's their forte in order to avoid discussing the economy. I think national unity is an extraordinarily important issue. Can we but apparently it's not an issue in this campaign. Can so we I'm in the West uh, rely is an issue. Sorry, sir. Can we in the West rely on Ryan's presence to keep everything copacetic in Quebec? But is there still not a grave danger with uh, Alberta and Quebec, and British Columbia and Quebec, that this country still suffers from a grave national crisis? And who can do anything about it? I'm talking well, about. First of all, of Mr. Ryan is leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Levesque is still the Premier of Quebec, and he's still fighting hard to bring Quebec out of Canada, and he's going to have a referendum next May or June. So, and he, he's published a, a white paper in the fall saying that he meant business. So I think that is what we have to concern ourselves with at this time. That is a clear and present danger, and we must sh make sure that the referendum is won by the pro-Canada forces. 
After that, presumably, there'll be an election, which I hope Mr. Ryan will win. But, you know, there are several stages ahead, and I don't think we can jump to any conclusions. And Mr. Ryan will be just as difficult. No, wait. Will Mr. Ryan be as difficult to deal with as Mr. Levesque? Mr. Ryan will be as difficult to deal with as Premier Bennett, uh, as Premier Lougheed, and the rest of them. Because they are provincial leaders, they want the best possible deal for their provinces. And they're going to try and get that through the Constitution, they're going to try and get that through equalization grants, they're going to try and get that by the federal government giving them jurisdiction over all kinds of things, forests, offshores, uh, and so on. I, if I become Prime Minister, I will continue to say what I said before, there has to be a voice speaking for Canada. We will not give in to the provinces every time they say boo. We will try and make sure that the people of Canada get a good, strong national government. Because what the people of Canada are interested in is not who exercises what power and who spends what dollar of their tax money. It's whether that money is well spent and whether the jurisdiction is well exercised. And I think the rest of it is, you know, fights between politicians. You haven't really got over your famous flip-flop wage and price control, sir. That comes to mind because I was suddenly thinking you're attacking the, the Clark Crosby budget like mad. And yet I've got the dreadful feeling that not you nor anybody else can really stop the cost of energy going up in this country. $1.90 Canadian in California, $3 Canadian in Britain, and we're paying $1.10 for gas. Jack, 70% of everything we consume in Canada is produced in Canada. It's produced at eight or ten dollars a barrel. Why do you want it to go up to forty and fifty a barrel? They like Trudeau and keep cheap gas. Is that right, sir? Not cheap gas, because cheap gas is when we paid a dollar a barrel for it, or two, or six, as I negotiated with Alberta in nineteen seventy four, six fifty. But there's a difference between six fifty and thirty and forty and fifty dollars. Spot sales now are forty five dollars a barrel. No, that's not that's not cheap. And twelve dollars isn't cheap, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper than forty five. How about some telephone calls, sir? After the break. Go ahead to Mr. Trudeau. Good morning to the Moscow Pilgrim. Keep it short and sharp, please. <laughs> the moral war of Canadian politics. Mr. Trudeau, in 1963, you stated the political philosophy of the Liberal Party is quite simple. Say anything, think anything, or better still, don't think anything at all, but put us in power because we're the ones who can best govern you. My question is this. Given your cynical feelings and distaste for the Canadian voter, particularly here in Western Canada, how can you with any conscience ask anyone to vote for your party? We have here in Vancouver Center the spectacle of one Art Phillips, standing there as though he was in his right mind. Uh, just a moment. I don't mind you insulting or attacking anybody. Come to the question. How can you ask us to vote for us? Why didn't you come here to BC rather than to the disco party in New York? Hold on, you'll get an answer. Well, uh, uh, that's your very quote. I just noted it. We're the ones who can best govern. After all, that is, that is the point of trying to get elected, isn't it? Those are the words I use. We're the ones, the Liberals, who can best govern. And I think that's the test that the people have to, have to answer. Who can best govern? Mr. Clark, with his, uh, with his move to Jerusalem, with his uh, off and on with Petro-Canada, with his 18 cents a gallon uh, excise tax, with his changes of mind and policy on everything? or the Liberals. And I don't know how the people will vote, but that is the test. And if I wrote that in 1963, I still think it's a good test. He who, are the, who are the ones who can best govern? He was also referring to your non-appearance at the party here, sir, and I know you'll answer him, in which you went to New York instead of coming to a Liberal do on the coast. Sure, I never accepted to come to a Liberal do on the coast. I'm sure some people said I would come, but I said I never said I would come. It was fabricated almost. No, people hope that I'm going to be everywhere. They say I'm unpopular everywhere, but they want me to go to, to see them. And then when I say, no, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I can't go, um, then they say, why didn't you come? It was, uh, uh, the only mistake you made was getting a picture on the paper in New York. Well, I guess that was a mistake. I didn't uh, pay the photographer enough, I guess. Go ahead, please. Good morning. It's a far pleasant change to see a, more, a less arrogant prime minister, or pardon me, Pierre Trudeau, who appears to be more at peace with himself and with the world today. Well, thank you. 
I'd like to say that uh, Mr. Trudeau's idea of bringing the two-rail system across into the port of Vancouver is a fine idea, except that we have a, a problem right now with the second narrows bridge down, and there's an isthmus across the North Shore, which uh, apparently the uh, CPR has the right of way, and uh, I can't understand why it hasn't been utilized in the, in the past as a railroad link to the North Shore. Yeah, the moment that bridge fell down, sir, we were in real trouble with our grain shipments because it is the only rail link at the moment across the Second Narrows. But uh, didn't uh, Clark appoint a czar, Horner, to look into these things? You never, you never appointed an overall boss in the port, did you? We had, uh, we had a minister, Mr. Otto Lang, a Westerner, in charge of, of the grains, including the transportation. He was also minister of transportation, and uh, that was, I think, better than having a czar who was answerable to nobody. It was is a, your a point, minister who was answering every day in the House of Commons. Is your point, Colour, that we could have a new link round the end of the Broad Inlet? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, we'll leave it. Deep cove. The Thank you. Thank you. Right away, Thank you. Go ahead, please. Well, I'm I'm happy to hear that uh, there's a, a ready-made place to put uh, the uh, the second track. I don't know where it would pass. Quite frankly, you were saying earlier, Jack, that it would have some trouble going through one place. Perhaps the caller has given us the answer. There's where it would go through. Go ahead, please. Um, I just got a few things to say. First, I'd like to say that um, Mr. Trudeau, I think you're doing a very terrific job, and that you should keep it up. And uh, Thank you, miss. I've got another thing to say. Say it. Yeah. Um, does Mr. Trudeau support Carter's proposed ban of the Olympics? Well, uh... Sure. I think I, uh, sh shortly, I was telling Jack earlier that uh, I didn't think that just if a few countries, particularly Western capitalist countries, banned the Olympics and the rest of the world went, I didn't think it was a good idea. Okay. I don't think we should have a deadline of 20th of February. I think we should make work to make the Soviets get out of Afghanistan. I don't think they'll do it being a big power as they are. Uh, by giving them a deadline and say by Monday morning, whatever the date is, you've got to be out. I think you've got to negotiate with them and you've got to make sure that the weight of world opinion is known to them as it was made known in the United Nations. So it's not a simple yes or no. Go ahead, please. Mr. Trudeau? Yes, ma'am. Um, welcome back. Thank you. That's very nice. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to see that you're, you're back and... Uh, um, Mr. Webster? Yes? You must have a short cameraman working the lenses. Because Private joke. So good. <laughs> I insist that the camera is high to hide my jowls when I have a low camera. I direct myself short and succinctly and precisely to Mr. Trudeau. I want to congratulate you, Mr. Trudeau, on the low profile you kept when uh, uh, Joe Clark and Flora McDonald flubbed on the Tehran hostage-taking incident and I, I want to compliment you on the fact that you continued to harangue him on his foreign policy because if you had done otherwise you certainly would have spilled the beans well that's a good question ma'am i i think i agree with it uh, it's uh, pr president president carter uh, was Please. begging the uh, the uh, his allies to support him in his uh, contest with Iran and over the hostages, and that's what I was doing in the House of Commons, and I'm afraid that's not what Mr. Clark's government was doing. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. Yes, ma'am. Um, there are, at present, millions of Canadians living below the poverty level and slightly above it, and there are over a million people that are unemployed. None of the political parties in this election campaign, including your party, has expressed a concern for providing a program for Canadians that will protect their income at a level that is above poverty. What I want to ask you is, do Canadians have to accept poverty? And please, before you respond, don't tell me that we can't afford it, because I think it's obviously a matter of priority, whether we're concerned about you know, the many people in this country that are living... Fair enough, ma'am. We've only got a few minutes left. Well, I, I agree with uh, the caller that it is a matter of priorities, and I think in this campaign we've indicated where our priorities were. We made one costly election promise, and that was to help people below the poverty line. When we promised to give $35 a month more under the guaranteed income supplement, it was in order to help people who are in need and over 65 to get greater assistance. Now, that's the liberal principle of helping first those who need it most. 
And uh, that was my argument with Jack earlier. We can spend millions and billions on the defense, but we also have to think of those who are living below the poverty line, and that was our promise. You are the man, though, who's been blamed as the architect of the financial mess and the heavy, heavy national debt we've had. I can quote people on that if you like. Well, I'd like you to quote Mr. Diefenbaker uh, in the days when he was having a national debt of a third of our gross national product. That's back in 1959-60. The national debt then was, uh, I think, 35%, to be precise, of, of the gross national product. And Under our you? government, it was 26%. But so, you know, and Mr. Diefenbaker wasn't putting the government in bankruptcy. Countries like Japan, countries like Germany have a national debt which is higher than ours. So you can't just have an obsession on national debt. It depends what you do with it. And if you do, as this lady was suggesting, spend money in order to keep people out of poverty and create jobs, that's okay. Mr. Trudeau, the election in, is on Monday. What have you got in the Liberal platform that is in any way new, which would deserve, not merely polls, cause you to deserve to be elected? You've, you've criticized, but I can't think of anything new you've said which might indicate the, an industrial strategy, perhaps more to the left, closer to the NDP. What is new about you and the Liberal Party? Well, for, for one thing, we've uh, said that we would uh, not only support Petro-Canada, but we would increase it. We would make sure it went into the alternate energy field and uh, develop for Canada new technologies and for the world, new technologies in uh, wind, solar, biomass, and so on. We've also made a, a clear commitment in the social area that I've just talked about. We've talked out here in terms of making sure that the port of Vancouver were more managed locally than from Ottawa. We've had the double tracking. We've made sure that the Canadian position, well, Foothills is not new, of course. It is trying to correct some mistakes that, uh, that Mr. Clark has made. Uh, we've announced an industrial strategy just yesterday and a whole energy policy a few weeks ago, which would be very new. It would be a price made in Canada for oil, as I've explained earlier, not a price which is linked to OPEC prices, to that world cartel. So there's a lot of new things, uh, Jack. Are we not quite lucky, though, that the nation is basically so healthy that it doesn't matter which minority government we might have after Monday? Well, I mean, you're expressing a value judgment there that a minority government is, uh, is good for Canada. Um, Do I you think it would be? Look, I think it's important that, gov that Canada have a strong government. I'm not asking for a majority. I'm just asking for the people to vote for the government they think best. But I know that at this time, when Mr. Lawhee does a minor majority government, Mr. Bennett has a majority government, or Mr. Levesque has a majority government, I think it would be nice to have in Ottawa a government which doesn't have to look right and left before it, uh, it makes a decision on anything. I think it should be as strong as Mr. Lawhee's government or Mr. Levesque's government. My thanks to Pierre Trudeau. Webster after the break. <clears throat> well, it was a lengthy session, wasn't it? Right at this moment, I don't remember a single word he said, except that uh, he would call a leadership convention if he forms a government and pick a successor before the end of the next parliament. So he made it crystal and brutally clear this morning, if elected, he'll become prime minister, but that he will only serve a maximum of one term. I think he made that quite clear. Oil policy, we got a little bit bogged down. I tried to get my thought across to prime minister that, uh, well, I did, I said to him, are we not lucky in the fact that the country is so healthy that it, that it can survive either of the parties? which unfortunately does indicate a kind of, I suppose, cynical viewpoint of many Canadians today. What else did he talk about this morning? The Olympics. Now, he was quite firm on the Olympics. He obviously thinks with, with Kalanin's committee's decision of 73 countries saying go ahead with the Olympics, that unless you had unan unanimity between the Western nations and the non-aligned countries, that the game should go on. My own opinion, ugh, what does that matter? Um, budget. 
talk about the budget. Lost me on the prices. It was very blunt, though. I said, vote liberal and get cheap gas. And he came back on the $8 a gallon produced price, and there's no way he says that he's going to go for the Clark type of 18 cent and 14 cent a gallon formula on price increases. That was something, I think, which is quite new. Tankers on the West Coast, we agreed to disagree. I mean, I remember well when David Anderson got the chop chop because of doing his Ralph Nader bit in Washington. Maybe not from Trudeau, but certainly from big noises in the Liberal Party in the West Coast. And he maintains that, you know, he was solidly buying foothills and that Clark muffed it. And my opinion, I'll be brutally blunt with you, is that the tankers are on the West Coast now. We're as much in danger of oil spills today as we will be 10 years down the road. And that Foothills withdrew from the oil, oil Canada land line route. And I don't feel inclined to blame Clark too much for that. I don't know what you do. I think perhaps with the Iran situation and the new feeling of warmth towards Canada, it might be possible to hammer Clark into a land route. But it's a question of financing, too. What else? Oh, I should have tackled them more on immigration. I did talk to him about the draft dodgers. Uh, evaded it a little bit, but obviously does not see eye to eye with Flora MacDonald, who laid down the law that draft dodgers in any future American situation involved in this particular crisis would go to the bottom of the immigration list in Canada. Says that Ed Broadbent's talking nonsense, in effect, that's what he said, about arbitrarily government cutting of interest rates. Didn't think the double track railway was funny at all. Everybody else does. Forgot to ask him about Trident. Didn't really have time. But his liberals have promised to put money into Trident. Of course, it was his government that set up the conditions in which Trident did not qualify for the government. And it was Huntington who put down the chopper on them initially. Although the Tories, I believe, have now promised also money for Trident or indicated they might well be interested. Wouldn't talk about the minority position with the NDP. Didn't get a chance to ask him about the DVA move to PEI, which a number of old-timers had asked me about. Uh, Three-year capping on index pensions, we mentioned that. And I'll take phones, like it or lump it. Nothing else to do between now and half past ten. Wish Keith Morrison had stayed. Could have put him on. Keith's traveling with uh, Trudeau, you know, the CTV guy. Seems a remarkably nice fellow for. Of course, he comes from the West originally. He's not yet a member of the Eastern Media Mafia. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Good morning. I think you had a very interesting program this morning. You've certainly made me decide who to vote for. I think old uh, Pierre is still our man. Uh, oh, I gee. think you got a lot of votes through your program. Oh. That's bad news. Yeah, very good, Jack. I don't like that kind of call because, uh, you know, he flew out here for the interview and you wonder, is it an insult or a compliment? No, no, I think it's a very... I don't know what it is. Okay. Huh. Williams Lake. Hello, Jack. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Trudeau. Can I hear you. To you uh, on your comment to the uh, armed forces being in good shape. I, s I say they're not in good shape. They're in horrendous shape, as I told you a couple days ago. And um, I don't see why we can't. You got to be together. joking. In 19, March of 1977, the federal cabinet instructed the Minister of National Defense to initiate a project a program that would lead to the selection of new fighter aircraft in 1978. Oh, that's been going on for 20 years. Where are you from? Hello. Victoria, go ahead, please. Victoria, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, hello, Jack. Yes. I enjoyed your program this morning. There was a question I would have liked to have put to Pierre Trudeau. And that is, uh, briefly, what are your short-term and long-term proposals for dealing with the federal deficit? I wouldn't have done that anyway because we got lost in figures. You notice how we got all bogged down in the billions for the oil thing? No, but it's just a matter he... of principle. Whether he is going to control the deficit or how much and what extent. I'm glad you didn't get through. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Register, for a very fine program. 
I've now decided exactly who I'm going to vote for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Vote for Kitty Handel. The one that wants to put us up against the wall and shoot us. That's a joke, Kitty, if you're watching, by the way. Go ahead, please. I would like to ask Trudeau what was his personal finance. Are, are they the same as uh, our in Canada? Or And the second question... His what? Uh, are, what are his uh, personal finances? He's fairly wealthy, I should imagine. <laughs> I hope they are. They he's are worth a few million. It's been on the record that he's worth a few million. His father was a wealthy man. Uh, also, I would like to ask uh, in terms of... Uh, he's, he's trying to compare... Canada in terms of Japan and other things. I think Canadians should be in better shape than in Japan in terms of resources we have. We don't work as hard. What, what do you think that Canada, well, he's trying to uh, com, uh, compare uh, Canada in terms of Germany or uh, Japan. We don't work as hard. Oh, I'm sorry. As the Germans. The Germans have a natural discipline. Oh, uh, let's say Japan. He's trying to uh, compare in terms of... Don't understand your question. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yeah. Am I on the line? You certainly are, sir. Thank you. Jack, I have two questions. First one for uh, Pierre. Pierre is long gone, 15 minutes ago. Well, I'm, I'm sure it is, but we've been on, uh, on your line since 8.30, quarter to nine, trying to get to, so I'm here now. Say your piece. You're entitled. Good. But you. you'll have to hold until after this break, and then I promise you, you can have all the time to say your piece. Thank you for waiting, sir. Now go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first, what will uh, the Liberal government do towards providing a viable steel industry in the West. Didn't ask him. It's a provincial matter. Uh, Barrett talked about it for a long while. Bennett talked about it a little bit. The establishment of a steel industry is a provincial matter. Then why are we not ahead with it? Can we not get some federal funds? There was a time in this province when nobody wanted a smog-polluting, dirty steel foundry industry. Those times have changed. I think Jack, it's entirely a provincial England, matter. Pardon? You come from England. I do not come from England. Scotland. Well, That's closer. Well, the uh, industrial re revolution. When I was a small I'm boy... So, I'm sorry, Jack. I'm sorry. Where, where are your kilt, uh, man? You waited for two hours to tell me to wear my kilt? <laughs> Won't even go down my middle, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> See me in a kill? I'm a fine-looking fella. Go ahead, please. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, is Mr. Trudeau there? Went 20 minutes ago. Oh, well, anyways, uh, Mr. Edger, I'm a spokesman for the uh, work activity program for unemployed people. We're all unemployed young people, and we want to know what he was going to do for uh, the unemployment for young people in uh, British Columbia and about the fishing industry, if he's going to do uh, what his plans for license control and herring for the herring fishing trees. He wouldn't have known anyway. Uh. You need the minister for that. Where are you calling from? Vernon. Vernon, go ahead, please. Yes, first off, Jack, I'd like to say you did a fine job. It was a great interview. You know, I don't think you should have referred to Joe Clark as a wimp. You I know, not to bring out those personalities. No, 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 I compared them. I said, you've been insulted right, left, and center, called the shadow hiding in a little box controlled by Keith Davey, and I threw in the parallel insult. Yeah, it's kind of unfair. No, it's not. But I just want to say one thing. I was one of the undecided. But after that interview, and after the way Trudeau presented himself, he's the man to... Oh, I don't like people to do that on one single interview. It makes me feel a fink. Great. And you were good. And thanks. Thank you. Don't let that woman through ever again. <laughs> you know, mark down the combination of her voice. Voices, to me, have colors, you know. I have got ESP. I don't see the radiant halos which are around your bodies, but I see the colors in your voices. And I always recognize a voice by its color. So how does that grab you, eh? By the way, did you read that story about Winston Churchill Jr. and, and Saragashi and the ghost, eh? You gotta pick up, where did I read that? Globe and Mail yesterday, for those who like juicy sensation. 
He had gotta read about Winston's grandson, oh my God. And this, what was her name, Saragashi? Sagarushi? Karagoshi? Kashigari? Daily Star in London paid $200,000 for her memoirs, and I know why. <laughs> 200,000 pounds or dollars, I don't know. Hold on, I got to take a break. Now. Oh, Prince George. Hello. Hello there. Oh, no, wrong one. Prince uh, George, go ahead, please. Yes, we've become used in the West to hearing communist and third world uh, countries calling us Western capitalists. But I was surprised to hear Mr. Trudeau say Western capitalist countries. Why didn't he say Western democracies? I'll check.